احمد رسول کریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرخ لی صدری و یسر لی امری واخل العقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعل لی وزیر من اخلی اللہ فکنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہ الحمن رشتا و عزن من شرور انفسنا اللہ ارن الحق حقا و رزقن اتباعا اللہ ارن الباطل باطلا و رزقن اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو Today we will be starting the discussion of Surah An-Nisa from the verse number 31. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In tajtanibu taba'ira ma tunhawna anhu nukaffir anqum sayyatikum wa nudhilkum mudhalan qareeman. If you avoid the major sins which you are forbidden we will remove from you your lesser sins and admit you to a noble entrance that is into the paradise allah azza wa jal is ordering his bondsmen to avoid the major sins and is promising that if anybody avoids the forbidden major sins he will remove the smaller or the lesser sins and then will admit to the paradise that is a person who will avoid the major sins is being promised the entrance to the paradise now what are the major sins we do not need to write down or learn the list of the major sins I will just tell you the key points which will help you decide as to which sin is a major sin. Number one, when in Quran or Hadith, some sin has been labeled as haram. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah says, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْقَنْزِيرِ So all this is... eating and consuming all this will be what a major sin similarly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah bakra about riba says harrama riba so taking up giving or lending any form of riba will be what it will be a major sin indulging in anything which quran and hadith says is haram is a major sin second when allah in quran or the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in hadith talks about something and says that these are the limits of allah azza wa jal just like when we were talking about the laws of inheritance allah said tilka hududullah these are the limits of allah so all those things then which are labeled as hududullah or the limits of allah transgressing beyond them will be what it will be a major sin the third point is that when in quran or hadith for any sin if the punishment of hell fire has been mentioned like when we were studying the laws of inheritance it was said ya quluna fi butunihim nara they will be the people who eat or consume the properties of inheritance will be like what they will be consuming into their bellies the hellfire or it is um, said in the quran ulaika ashabun nari hum fiha khalidun these are the people of hellfire and they will eternally abide so all those activities or sins for which there has been Uh, mentioned as the punishment of hell they are also going to be considered as a major sin then fourth point is that whenever in quran and hadith there is a curse for the person doing a sin like allah says ulai kayal anhumullah wa yal anhumullah ilun or 
It is said, Yal anhumul malaika tu wannas, curse of people and angels be on him. So all these things which have been cursed, all those activities, all those uh, actions and sins which have been cursed in the Quran or the Hadith are highlighted major sins. And fourth, when in Quran and Hadith, words like La yuqallimuhumullah wa la yuzakihum wa lahum azabun alim that it is highlighted and clearly announced that for any person who commits that sin on the day of judgment for him neither will Allah converse with him nor will like to see him nor will purify him, him of the sins then this sin will also be considered and labeled as a major sin and sixth hadith clearly reports that if even the minor sins are committed with obstinacy and stubbornness and the pers person persistently knowingly very stubbornly sticks to the minor sins then even these minor sins will be considered as the major sins Allah help us to identify and not only to identify to avoid the major sins and save us all from obstinacy from stubbornness verse number 32 and do not wish for that by which Allah has made some of you exceed others for men is a share of what they have earned and for women is a share of what they have earned and ask Allah of his bounty indeed Allah is ever of all things knowing so now in the verse number 32 Allah has condemned envy and envious and jealous behaviors and in the verse Allah has suggested tips of getting rid of it and trying to avoid it you know actually this world and this worldly life is what it is a trial and Allah puts his bondsmen in trial by different ways and Allah's trial is mainly by the unequal division of his bounties he blesses a few with his bounties and deprives a few of his bounties and this actually is one of the ways he is going to put his bondsmen into trial in fact you know what this unequal division of Allah's blessings is what actually helps us developing develop the feeling of gratitude because you see that when we are thirsty only then we feel how important water and other drinks are it is only when we are hungry we we are grateful for food it is only when we get sick that we realize the importance of health seeing a poor person makes a wealthy man grateful to Allah for the wealth that he has been blessed so seeing the deprived people around us one can feel the gratitude of the blessings and the bounties of Allah that is exactly what has been explained in this verse and Allah is trying to make us clear that when you are deprived and you see someone who's blessed then do not be discontent do not develop negative feelings and do not get envious or jealous because envy you know what it is a negative frame of mind it is a negative and an extremely disliked thought process a person who is envious is a thankless person a person who is jealous or who is envious is actually mentally sick he is mentally sick to the extent that he is not content with what Allah has blessed him and he is not also satisfied by the distribution of the blessings of Allah and a person who gets envious it is very important to understand that a person who gets envious may just lose his ability to good deeds 
and it may get very, very easy for him to commit sins. It is an extremely bad state of mind. For if you realize the, the story of Shaitan and Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, when Allah asked Iblis to prostrate in front of Adam alayhi salam, what was there? Shaitan just got jealous. He was envious of Adam alayhi salam. And this envious state of mind ended up in what? In disobedience of Allah. He just refused to prostrate. So this is envy. This envious behavior or state of mind will leave or will lead a person towards disobedience and hence being thrown out of paradise the way shaitan was exiled from paradise. Then if we repeat the story of the sons of Adam alayhi salam, Habil and Kabil, the elder one just got envious and this envy was what opened the door to a such a such a great sin like the murder of his own real brother just imagine the son of a prophet developing envious feelings in his heart ends up with murdering his real brother and then the story of the brothers of Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam they were envious of their father's love and affection for Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam and this envy led them to what? A plan to murder Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam? Who are they? they? They were the sons of a prophet Hazrat Yaqub alayhi salam. They were the grandsons of a prophet Hazrat Ishaq alayhi salam. And they were the great grandsons of the prophet Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam Khalilullah. Sons and grandsons and great sons of the prophets they, if they develop the feelings of jealousy or they get envious to somebody, will end up in such, in committing such great and major sins. So that is why it is extremely important to stop ourselves from these negative frame of minds. This jealousy or this hasad or this envy you know, it brews up in stages. The first stage, the person just feels deprived seeing a blessed person or a blessed uh, a person or a fellow being who is blessed by the bounties of Allah. The person just feels deprived. And this feeling of being deprived causes him to become upset, to become anxious. He's depressed. He's tense. He's cribbing, he's grumbling, he's unhappy. And this anxieties and tensions and depressions may just leave down to, it may just lead down to nervous breakdowns. So you see, all these occasions when people are going through nervous breakdowns, it might be this, this very negative feelings of envy and jealousy, which might be the triggering cause. In the second stage, the person who was just upset and anxious in the second stage, he develops an intense and a severe desire to get what he hasn't or to get or to acquire what he has been deprived of. And in this stage, he just forgets. He just forgets the right, the wrong, the halal, the haram, the concept of sin, he just forgets the fear of Allah. He just forgets the fear of hereafter. He just, all what he remembers is that I have to get it in any way, right or wrong, beg, borrow, steal, loot, plunder, do whatever, but I have to get it. And that is why, and there is when he resorts to all forms of unlawful, sinful means to acquire the things. And then he becomes a disobedient and then he becomes a transgressor and the third stage is that when after getting the thing for himself he is not even content with that he desires that only only me only I should be having this thing and no one else and then he does all forms of 
all forms of sins and wrongs and he becomes what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says asfala safilin and he makes fun of people he tries to belittle and humiliate people and then he does leg pulling and then he does all forms of harsh and he does all forms of oppressions so now in the materialistic world of today this state of mind of being envious and being or being jealous of somebody it is extremely common it is extremely common so i would be suggesting some ways of preventing ourselves of indulging in these negative feelings so the first thing which i would be talking about is to prevent ourselves or our hearts getting envious is self analysis give yourself time a quality time of self analysis and do a strict self audit just just probe your heart just probe your feelings and see am i am i jealous of somebody am i envious of somebody's blessings and if you realize that this is so then accept it confess and after confession comes regret and then repentance seek forgiveness and ask for repentance and then promise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave it and ask for allah's help after this repentance and self analysis the second thing which would help us stopping ourselves from being un, uh, from being envious is to be grateful gratitude shukr and gratitude once a person starts seeing realizing and counting one's own blessings then the feeling of jealousy is obviously supposed to go off the third thing is zikr or remembrance of allah the more we remember allah the more we do zikr it will save our heart from the evil feelings and from the evil emotions the shaitan somehow manages to instill or inculcate in our souls the fourth is what allah is suggesting in this ayah that for men is a share of what they have earned and for women is a share of what they have earned so if somebody around you is more blessed then they have obviously worked hard to earn for it and they have struggled and strived in life so okay you also you you go ahead you work hard you struggle you strive obviously by lawful and within the halal limits but if rather than just sitting and just wailing and just feeling upset and just developing negative feelings and negative thought processes go go ahead and work and work hard in life and struggle and achieve what they have achieved and the fifth suggestion is which in this aya allah is suggesting ask allah for his bounty so it is like supplicate to him it is he it is allah who has blessed the other person so okay you also you also go ahead and supplicate and ask for your share of bounties so this is a very positive outlook and this will save us from the negativity of jealousy and the negativity of uh, envying the other people prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam talking about envy has uh, in a hadith reported by hazrat zubair radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in mustad ahmad in tirmizi the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the maladies of the previous people are overtaking you and what are the maladies the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said jealousy and malice isn't it so very right these days there is a lot of jealousy and a lot of malice the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said jealousy and malice they are the ones to completely shave off i do not say that they shave the hair but they shave off the religion so this is a ill feeling in the heart which is going to ruin the religion the faith and the belief of a believer and a muslim astaghfirullah rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu ilaik rabbi ighfir warham wa anta khairur rahimin 
اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزا من شرور انفسنا اللهم رحمتك ارجو فلا تكلني الى نفسي من طرفة عين واصلح لي شأني كله لا اله الا انت اللهم اني اعوذ بك من زوال نعمتك Now the verse number 33. And for all, we have made heirs to what is left by the parents and relatives. And to those whom your oaths have bound to you, give them their share. Indeed, Allah is ever over all things a witness. The verse number 34 of Surah An-Nisa is a very very important verse regarded regarding the marital affairs Allah is saying ar-rijalu qawwamuna 'ala an-nisaa'i bima faddala Allah ba'dhum 'ala ba'dhim 'ala ba'dhim wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim Men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend from their wealth. Ar-rijalu kawamuna ala nisai. Men are in charge. Men are kawam. Kawam comes from the word kama. It means standing in Arabic. Kavam is a person who is standing over or above other people who are sitting. So what does a person who is standing over others do? Like It's just like imagining an invigilator in an examination hall. All the students who are solving their papers, the individualator of the examination of uh, the examination hall is standing over the rest of them. So what does a kavam do? The kavam orders, commands, and hence controls. Then the kavam would look after and protect. He would supervise, monitor, check and he will be doing the surveillance and the checking. So likewise, this ayah but calling all men ar-rijalu qawwamun is explaining very clearly and in detail the duties of the husband. Yesterday, ashiru hunna bil maruf, we discussed the mannerism, the behavior, the attitude of the husband. That itself also was the duty of the husband as far as his mannerism and conduct was concerned. So now being the kavam, the duties of the husband would be then what? Number one, he will be looking after. He will be looking after his wife and obviously his family and offsprings. He will be looking after what? He will be looking after the monetary issues of the family, the needs, the requirements, then the social dealings, their environment, their chastity, their religion, their ethics, their mannerism, their conduct, their behaviors. So he will be looking after so many things of the wife, of the children and of the whole of the family because he's, he happens to be the kavam. Then. Being the husband, being the kavam, he will protect them. He will be protecting them, protecting them from like evil and bad deeds, bad company, evil and bad environment from, from the difficulties and hardships of life. He will protect them from going astray. He will protect them from being misguided. He will protect their religion. He will protect their honor so he will be protecting so many things so on and so forth then being a kavam the duty of the husband is that he will be a guide to them he will guide them guide them for what 
guide them for what is right, what is wrong, what is halal, what is haram, what is good for hereafter. So he will be guiding them for their for their religion, for their matters and issues of belief. And then fourth point and the fourth duty of the husband being a kawam will be what? That he will check, he will monitor, he will supervise and he will be doing supervision and surveillance and checking of what? Of their manners, of their conduct, of their ethics, of their ibadah, of their salah, of their fast, of their purity, of their hygiene, of their akaid. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and we discussed in detail in Surah Baqarah, Allah said, Nisahukum harsullakum. Like the farmer looks, looks after his fields, the husband being the being the kawam will be looking after his wife and his spouse and his children. So the next point, being a kawam, being a person who is standing over and above the others and his family, he will be doing what? He will be ordering them. So the next duty of the husband is to order, to command and to control. So being a kawam, he is the leader. He is the person in charge. He is the controller of all affairs and issues in the and the matters in the family. He is going to head the family. Because you know that in all setups, you always need to have one head. Like in the departments of the colleges, of the schools, we always have one head of the department. The university has one vice, one VC or one vice chancellor. The factory has one general manager or the GM. Any organization has one chairman. And above all, the universe has one Allah. And that is exactly why there is there is so much peace, there is so much harmony in the universe. So if we want the system of our house and our family to run peacefully, smoothly and in harmony, then in the basic unit of the society, the home, the head of the family has to be one and that has been announced as the husband. So being kawam is basically twofold. This is also the duty of the husband and it is also the right of the husband. He has to be and he has to act as the leader and it is a trial for him. This is his duty and he has to be accepted as the leader and this is his right and this is the duty of his wife. She, she has to accept him as the commander, the kafam. Accepting him as the commander, she has to surrender to his commands. She has to obey his orders and she has to accept his policies and his dictations and his decisions. And in this ayah, if you see, Allah says, Ar-rijalu qawwamun. All men, or whatever color, whatever creed, whatever tribe, whatever state of mind, whatever state of education, whatever state of his wealth or richness, when a wife at the time when she is being married, she shows the willingness, she shows the willingness, willingness to be married to a man, then actually she is announcing and she is promising to accept his authority over her. So then once she has accepted him for marriage, she has accepted and she has announced and she has promised and she has declared that she will be accepting his authority over her. And so all men, may they be rich, they may be poor, they may be young, they may be old, they may be healthy, they may be sick, they may be strong, they may be weak, they may be educated, they may be uneducated. Once they, they happen to be the husband to a wife, 
they are the kawwa all men and all husbands will be considered as the kawam this i again repeat is the duty of the husband the trial of the husband and at the time is the right and the duty right of the husband and the duty of the wife as well now allah has made this kawam as a duty for the husband what sort of a kawam Allah has just not made him the kawam, but various points in the Quran, Allah has also taught him how to act as a kawam. He he does not he doesn't have to be, or in fact, he's not a hard-hearted, a harsh kawam. He's not ill-mannered. He's not bad-tempered. He doesn't use a loose tongue. He doesn't have a foul language. He doesn't go about here and there, slapping, hitting, hurting around in the family. No, he is what ashiruhunna bil maaruf. He is what nisa ukum harful lakum. He has been taught hunna lebasul lakum wa antum lebasul lahunna. So he is. He is a polite. He is a refined, cultured, well-mannered, soft-spoken, soft-hearted, cool-minded, patient, tolerant, loving, caring, sincere, kawam, and the husband. So this is all the duty of the husband, and these are all the rights of a Muslim wife. rights of the muslim wife that the husband acts like a kawam and behaves like this now the next thing is that why has allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen the husband to be the kawam allah is mentioning the reason here also wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim the first reason that because all forms of monetary commitments have been handed over to him he is the provider for the family and he handles all the economic issues and the matters so authority has been given to the person who earns and who spends who provides so and then he's been given the authority over the wife secondly because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bima faddala allah ba'dhum ala ba'd this was the first reason because he's he is stronger allah has given him fazilat and allah has given him one grade up and this is what he is stronger physically and emotionally we all do agree to the fact that men are physically strong and they are emotionally strong men have a higher emotional iq they are strong willed they are generally more patient they are generally more to tolerant they are generally generally usually like 95% of husbands are more cool minded and patient than the wives they do not lose temper they do not get upset on trivial issues they are more composed they have more self com- uh, control and that is why and the two reasons why the husband has been made as the kawwa all husbands are therefore being instructed to act as a kawwa and a caretaker and the mannerism and the behavior of the kawwa has also been in a very black and white form being instructed and guided over to the kawams so after talking about the duties and the mannerism and the behavior and the conduct of a muslim husband in a muslim family allah will now talk about the muslim wives that what are their duties and what characteristics does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want a muslim wife to develop within her temperament so now coming to the next part of uh, verse number 34 talking about the muslim wives fasalihatu qanitatun hafizatu lil ghaib bima hafiz allah the wives are like what righteous women Righteous, righteous women who are devoutly obedient guarding in the husband's absence what allah would have them guard 
so from here onwards now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be explaining the duties of the muslim wife and the characteristics of the muslim wife now before i start the discussion the first thing which i would want all of us all of the muslim wives and all the muslim women to realize very clearly and accept from the core of our hearts is that the foremost claim on the wife is of her husband hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha narrates in a sahih hadith that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the greatest claim on a woman is of her husband and the greatest claim on a man is of his mother so this is the balance which allah has taught the husband and the wife the man and the woman in their normal practical day to day life and the right of the husband for the woman that after a woman gets married then after allah the first right on a muslim woman is of her husband Hazrat Abu Huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports a hadith in Tirmizi in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a few words which makes this concept very clear Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if i were to order anyone to prostrate himself before another i would order a woman to prostrate herself before her husband so this is it the right of the husband comes after the right of allah for a muslim woman and there is another similar hadith sahih hadith uh, the narrator narrates that a uh, companion of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat muaz bin jabal he had uh, been to syria and uh, when he returned he prostrated himself before the messenger of allah and uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked in amazement ma haza ya muaz what is this mas like what are you doing why are you doing all this then uh, hazrat mas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he explained that he has been to syria and he saw people they were prostrating prostrat- uh, themselves before their religious leaders and their priests and their chiefs so to uh, show his respect and regard to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he thought that he 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 might as well do the same the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not do that so prostrating of a man in front of any human being is not permissible and it is strictly prohibited in islam prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not do that and then he added if i were asked to if i were if i were to ask anyone to prostrate himself before another besides allah i would have asked women to prostrate themselves before their husbands so as far as the order of preference is concerned for the muslim women the first obedience and the first right is of allah and then of obedience of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then the obedience and the right of her husband so now the first characteristic which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> the first characteristic which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in quran for a good muslim wife is what fasalihatu the righteous women the pious women the virtuous women so being righteous pious and virtuous is the first thing which is important why we are making selection of a wife a man is selecting a wife for himself or a mother is looking for a wife for the son or a sister is trying to find a wife for his brother so the first priority and the primary preference has to be her being a saliha a righteous muslim woman prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the whole world is a valuable position and the best possession of the world is a righteous wife allah make us one of them allah make our daughters and make our daughter in laws and make our grand daughters be one of these righteous muslim wives the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a righteous 
or a virtuous wife is the pillar of her husband's faith so she determines she strengthens she supports and she protects and she helps her husband in his faith in his religion in his islam and in his honor that is why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a uh, sahih hadith reported in bukhari has guided the muslim men to set the merits for choosing a wife prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you marry a woman for three reasons that is the choice when you make for a wife is you look for these three merits for her beauty for her wealth and for her religion oh believers be successful marry women for the sake of their religion so this is the preference or the priority of religion of being righteous and of being virtuous that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has advised similarly prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has warned and he said in a sahih hadith do not marry women just for the sake of her beauty it is very much possible that her beauty might lead her to destruction do not marry a woman just for the sake of her wealth it is very much possible that her wealth might take her towards a loss you may be successful you marry women for the sake of their religion and a very comprehensive advice in the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that when you are proposed by a person with whose mannerism and whose religion that is whose faith and belief and whose religion you are content that is you are satisfied that his mannerisms are good and he is good in his faith and he has perfected his belief and you are content with it then accept the proposal so the first merit of a muslim wife which is mentioned here is salihatu the second is the next two are then going to be the duties of a muslim wife the first being qanitatun and the second being hafizat so what do we mean by qanitatun qanitatun means very intensely obedient qaf noon ta means obedience and qanitat we mean the obedient women obedient to whom obviously by the order of preference obedient first of all to allah obedient then to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and last but not the least obedient qanitat obedient to her husband obviously within the limits of quran and hadith she stays obedient now to open our hearts and to make it very clear and to make us accept the importance of our duty of being obedient to the husband and to make us realize the rewards an obedient wife has been promised in quran and hadith i'm going to i'm going to quote quite a few hadith so that we get very clear headed about it and we also get tempted by the rewards promised by allah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Hazrat Abu Huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Nasa'i and Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu also reports in a Sahih hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said your best wives that is the best wives are what your best wives are those when you look at them you feel pleasure when you order them they obey you and they look after or they protect your honor your wealth and your secrets when you're not around so this is the quality and the duty of the best wife and i again repeat that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly said that if i had to allow anybody to prostrate anyone other than allah i would have asked the women to prostrate in front of their husbands 
in a hadith reported by Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, in fact, it is a huge promise. It is a huge promise by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that if a woman offers, now go on making your countdown and go on putting your scores. If a woman offers the five daily prayers, keeps the fasts of Ramazan, got the score of two? So far, so good. Five daily prayers, keep the fasts of Ramazan, guards her honor, and fourth, obeys her husband, then she can enter heaven by whatever door out of the eight doors of heaven she would desire. That is a woman who does all these four things, fasting, offering salah and guiding her honor and obeying her husband, she will have the super bumper offer that, oh, you Muslim woman, you can enter out of whichever door of the paradise you want to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. Then, Hazrat Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha reports in Tirmizi that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised and said that a wife who who passes away in a state that her husband was pleased with her, she will enter the paradise. Prophet has in another hadith mentioned in some other words, he said that you cannot enter paradise until Allah is pleased and Allah will be pleased if the husband is pleased. So the player of Allah is the player of the husband and the anger of the husband is the anger of Allah. I would want to clarify that for a version for an unmarried girl, the first right after Allah is of her father. Like we we heard in Surah Baqarah that Prophet said, Rizaullahi bi Rizaul Walid, Suhtullahi bi Suhtul Walid. So the first right is the right of the father. But after that woman gets married, after Allah, the first right is of her husband. So if the husband is pleased, Allah is pleased. And if the husband is displeased and happy, Allah is displeased and unhappy. Similarly, Prophet ﷺ addressed all women and said, all of those who are desirous of entering the paradise should obey Allah. All of those who are desirous of entering the paradise should obey Allah. But you cannot obey Allah until you obey your husbands. To the extent that if the husband asks you, or orders you to run between those two red mountains, she should do so. The Prophet ﷺ was, was sitting in an open ground and there were two red mountains and he pointed towards them and he said that if the husband says something which seems, which seems so illogical and so irrational, that why must I run? Why should I run? Why do I have to run? But if the husband says, instructs and orders the wife to run between those two mountains and seems very irrational and illogical and unpractical and pointless and useless. But if the husband is ordering, there's not to question why, there's but to do and die. That is exactly how a wife is supposed to obey her husband. Obviously, obviously, if she can physically run between the two mountains, if she if she has an arthritis, if he has certain issues, obviously then she would not be expected to do so. And uh, then obedience to Allah, obedience to the husband is so very important that taking his permission to go out of the house, the Prophet Wasallam in a Sahih Hadith says, that when a woman leaves her house without the consent or the permission of her husband, then an angel on the heaven curses her and all the things she passes by curse her till she returns back. So the curse of the angel and curse of all the lively things from which she passes or which she comes across, so the curse of it is making what? 
it is a major sin to leave your house without the permission or without the consult, a consent or the agreement of the husband. And I would want to clarify that women generally know Women generally know where her husband would allow us to go and we do not need to ask for his permission for every trivial issue and every small thing because we automatically understand that obviously he is not going to stop us from going to the market. He might not be stopping us to go to uh, fetch the child from the school or he might not be uh, stopping us from many things. But the wives clearly know and in hearts of hearts we do know and realize that this is a place i'm not sure i'm not clear that he might or he might not but the moment when you are not sure and the and the thing which you're not clear headed and in heart of heart he know you know that he won't be liking it then for that specific place or that specific situation or get together you need to seek his permission and on the contrary and on the contrary, a woman who obeys the husband, just look at look at what she's going to get in the worldly, in the worldly life. The Prophet ﷺ promises that a wife who obeys and serves her husband, supplicating will be for her. That is, who will be supplicating for her? All the birds of the skies, the beasts in the jungle, the fish in the depths of the oceans and the angels in the heaven, as long as she is obeying and serving her husband. So this is the merit and this is the huge reward which is being promised to an obedient wife. The Prophet wasallam, in some other words said, the best women, Allah make us one of them, Allah make our daughters and daughters-in-laws and our granddaughters and the girls of our offsprings make us make all of them one of them. The best women amongst my followers are those who serve and obey their husbands in all matters except the disobedience of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such a lady Prophet ﷺ promised such a lady will be rewarded in one day and one night. The reward like a martyr in the path of Allah. Subhanallah. 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 Then the Prophet ﷺ informed all the Muslim wives in a Sahih Hadith, a wife is the closest to Allah when she is serving attending and obeying her husband so there we are and that is what we need to learn and that is what we need to understand and that is what we need to adopt then in another in another hadith the prophet said he warned he actually clearly warns Three people whose salah will not raise beyond their heads, that is their salah will just not be accepted. It will not be raised towards the heaven to be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will not be raised above their heads to be to be recorded in the illiyin. Three people whose salah will not be raised beyond their heads. Number one, the slave who escapes from his master until he returns. A person who is intoxicated until, that is, he drank and he was drunk until he regains his consciousness. And the third is a wife whose husband, a wife whose husband commanded her a righteous act and she refused and he's angry with her. So a wife with whom her husband is angry or annoyed due to a right cause until he makes up. So, if the husband is annoyed, Allah is annoyed. If the husband is displeased, Allah is displeased. If husband is unhappy, Allah is unhappy. If we are disobedient to the husband, we are disobedient to Allah. And if we are obedient to the husband, we are obedient to Allah. And if we, and if we pass off in this state of obedience and service to the husband, we shall Inshallah, according to the promises of Hadith, enter by whichever door of the paradise we would want. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. 
So now coming to the third point, Hafizatul lil ghaibi bima hafizullah. The wives are those who who are guarding the husbands in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. Hafizat are those who are doing what? Hafazwat. Hafaza. Protect. Guard. They protect or guard what? His valuable, his precious, his dear, his near belongings. When? In his absence. When he's not around. So what would need to be protected by the wife? What would she need to guide? His honor and her own honor. His bed, his secrets, his money, his wealth, the environment of his house, his children, and last but not the least, his dear, old, sick, weak parents, his mother, his beloved father, looking after and caring for his parents is what Swalihat, Qanitat, Hafizat is expected to do. It is her duty. She is duty bound. I, I today hear of so many religious scholars talking and saying and dividing parents and very clearly announcing that his parents are for him to look after and her parents are for her to look after. Now, Zubillah, how do we deprive and how do we misguide? What sort of a swaliha? What sort of a qanita? What sort of a hafiza wife is she going to be? How can she be a righteous woman? How can she be an obedient, obedient person of the Allah, an obedient wife of the husband? And how can she be a guarding wife of the husband? If she is not looking after these muhsineen, these nearest and dearest relations of her husband, obviously, if she is a swaliha, she is a righteous, pious, virtuous woman, she's, she's not expected to do that. And all husbands, all husbands of Qanitat are obviously expecting and obviously guiding and obviously instructing the wives to look after their parents. And this, no doubt, is the dearest and the nearest and the most valuable belonging of the husband which he is leaving behind in the house. And then why? Why does he have to leave them behind? Obviously, obviously, to be able to go out, to earn, to earn for whom? To earn for her. To be able to provide for her, to be able to feed her, to be able to clothe her to be able to fend and fetch for her children and the family. So if he is having to go out and leave his sick parents, his dear mother, his beloved father in the house dependent on her, then being a Saliha, being a Qanita, being a Hafiza, she is duty bound. It is her duty. It is not only her duty. It is her privilege. It is a blessing. It is a rahma. And do, do we divide Rahma? Parents, how can we divide them? Allah has been so, so very kind that if before marriage, if before marriage we just had two gates to paradise, two feeds, two souls under, way, under where we had our paradise, after marriage they will multiply to four? Who is going to divide your Rahma? How can we say for you are your parents and for me are my parents? And how can we say and how can we instruct the Muslim women that you are not supposed and you're not duty bound to look after your parents, not duty bound to look after his parents and your mother-in-law and your father-in-law? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us one of those, make us, make us one of those wives who accept, who realize, and who are dutiful. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayunin wa ja'alna lil imama. 
O oh Allah, make our husbands and our children the coolness of our eyes and make us the leaders of the God-fearing. Make us the Imam of the Muttaqeen. Rabbana tuqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'ul alim wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Now, after explaining the duties of the Muslim husband, the duties and the rights of the Muslim wife, now, in the words, in the words 34, beyond this, Allah is going to explain that if there is a quarrel or if there is a disagreement between the wife and the husband, then how are we to settle it and how are we or the husband supposed to go about it? Because Allah has clearly announced in Quran, وَسُلْهُ khair that staying in peace and avoiding disagreement is obviously the best thing. So now Allah is uh, suggesting a means and the steps to prevent all that. But those wives from whom you fear, what? I'm not saying arrogance. I'm saying you fear that they will be in a state of what? Then do what? First advise them. Then do what? Then do what? Forsake them in their beds. And finally, finally strike them. But because of all this, if they obey you once more, seek by no means against them. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted and grand. So now, if this there is a disagreement, a fight between the husband and the wife, this is a solution to the situation and the scenario. How should be it handled by the Qawam and the husband? Allah is guiding and instructing. Now, to understand the whole concept, first of all, I would want to make the meaning of Nushu's clear. Because until and unless you clearly comprehend what is meant by the women's nishus, nishus ahunna, what does it mean and imply, you will not be able to understand the whole uh, message. And in fact, we might be one of them to misinterpret and we might misunderstand the whole concept. So by nishus, we mean it is a condition of arrogance. Nishus is a condition of arrogance where a person in full obstinacy and stubbornness leads to severe disobedience. I repeat again for you to make it more clear. Nishus is a condition of arrogance, obstinacy and stubbornness leading to severe disobedience. Now what is this? The condition is, the state of affairs is that when the husband is telling the wife, the ordering, instructing the wife something right, according to the principles of Quran and Hadith and within the Hadood of Quran and Hadith, and she is disobeying. The stance of the husband is correct and right, but out of sheer obstinacy and stubbornness, in full arrogance, the wife is refusing to obey. Now, how is the husband, the kavam, supposed to deal with it? I actually feel that this is the test of his nerves. He was made the kavam because he had strong emotions. He had strong nerves. And here are his nerves being tested. The first thing which is allowed and he is being instructed to do is farizuhunna. Wow, ain zwad means what? It means to advise, to counsel with love affection, kindness, gently, politely, lovingly, making somebody understand a thing logically, convincingly. Now, the first thing is that if she's not agreeing and she's not obeying, then he needs to advise her in all this format. And I tell you, putting my hands on my heart and you put your hands on your heart, 30 to 40 percent of the women's will abide and will, they will obey when the husband deals her like that. 
Now, if she still doesn't do that and she still doesn't obey, then and she sticks to her disobedience, then the next thing is, وَحْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَزْوَاجِ That you separate your beds from them or you forsake them in the beds. And uh, this is being done. You walk out of their bedrooms and you make them sleep separately and you separate your beds. This is just being suggested and it is being done because we know that men are emotionally strong women is women are emotionally labile they're temperamental they're weak they get stressed out faster as compared to men it's just a fight of wills you know since the man happens to be stronger emotionally he is being instructed they just walk out on him but this he's supposed to keep within the limits of the house it the matter of the issue of the how to not go outside and nobody other than the husband and a wife are supposed to be aware of the whole setup now this is like the husband is trying to convey that he's angry he's annoyed he's unhappy he's sad and he is uh, not on talking terms with the wife and believe you me the next about 40 50 percent of the wives will comply and will obey with this all but now if she is still disobedient and her disobedience is persisting the last method which the husband is asked to resort is wadribuhunna hit her now this allowing the husband to hit the wife is again it again raises a lot of hues and cries and the defaming techniques now subillah against islam that islam oppresses the women it is allowing the husband to beat her to hit her to physically abuse her so we need to understand the situation she's being stubborn she would just not comply and accept and you know if she persists her behavior he might just just get sick of it the matter might just end up in a divorce the house will break the marriage will break she is being and she is just acting foolishly she is not realizing that the bond might the bond might break she just needs someone to give her a good dose to prevent the serious repercussions that is why to save the house to save the family to save the marriage the permission to hit or beat is being given and the limit and the manner of hitting has been strictly limited by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i just narrated a hadith last day that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if any husband has to hit the wife he should not hit her on the face he should not hit her as if to leave a mass a mark of hitting on her body he is supposed to hit her gently so it is not a matter of oppression it is not hitting hard or hurting her it is not a permission of physical abuse this is no permission for her or for the husband to be hitting to be hurting to be torturing to be persecuting to be cutting her nose to be dragging her on the roads to be throwing her out of the house no it is what it is just a gentle and a mild jolting it is just a mild jolting to just make her realize the absurdness of her attitude and behavior just to save her marriage this is just to give her to give her a wake up call it's it's just like saying hello hello act rational and save your family and then allah says that in either of all either of all these options if because of all these they start obeying you once more then seek by no means against them that is if she has agreed to what you are saying then you have no permission to go on hitting her you are not allowed to be to went off your anger you cannot take revenge you cannot lose self control it is what it is just a limited a titrated a self controlled method of punishment and i feel it is a very heavy emotional trial for the husband who has been made as the kafam and the caretaker allah says allah is ever exalted and grand and if you fear dissension between the two that is 
uh, in the verse number 35 allah says that if the above mentioned situation to settle the affairs it doesn't work out then what do you do and if you fear dissension between the two between the two that is between the husband and the wife the metal is not uh, settling and the disagreement is uh, fight is prolonging then send an arbitrator from his people that is the husband's relatives and an arbitrator from her people that is the wife's relatives and if they both desire reconciliation <coughs> If they both desire reconciliation Allah will cause it between them indeed Allah is ever knowing and acquainted with all the things Allah aliman habira is suggesting an alternative method that if by adopting the steps which were suggested to the husband the metal does not settle and the fight is prolonging and there is a chance that the relationship and the marriage may break and the situation may end up in a divorce to prevent that allah has suggested two arbitrators one from the male and one from the female side why is this being suggested because you know then when two individuals are a dagger is drawn and they are fighting and there's a disagreement then the disagreement tends to prolong just because of one main issue that both of them think that they are right and they are at the correct position and the other person is doing wrong so if you always keep on considering the other person wrong and you consider yourself right obviously the fight will never end but when you let a third party in and the third party is uh, on a, a neutral platform listens to the both and uh, at a neutral platform uh, tries to relate the behavior of the both they will the third party will obviously be in a better position to understand that who is doing the wrong and who is right and then these arbitrators allah says that if they both desire they both uh, we can mean the both arbitrators and we can mean the husband and the wife that is if they are desirous of reconciliation and that is that in any case if they want to patch up then allah will uh, cause reconciliation between them allah subhanahu wa taala help us understand all the commandments of quran help us understand our duties as wives the best characteristics we are supposed to develop as wives and allah subhanahu wa taala help us remember all we heard today help us believe all what we heard today help us act according to all what we heard today rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayun waj'alna lil muttaqina imama ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين ثم آمين إن شاء الله Tomorrow in our lesson we will be starting from the verse number 36 of Surah An-Nisa where we will be talking about the rights of the neighbors and the travelers and about our servants and slaves and how are we supposed to behave with the animals that is basically we will be talking about the rights of our bondsmen on us and uh, they are very important and we really need to relate and understand all the rights of the bondsmen around us because on the day of judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his own rights but he will not forgive the rights of his bondsmen so i would request you to invite as many as you can for the lecture of tomorrow inshallah see you tomorrow with the explanation of the verse number 36 of surah an-nisa fi amanillah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh